Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Mincy. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. There's a pointer here if you need it. Good morning. Uh, so uh, I returned to Texas after about, oh, 10, 12 years when I was here at the uh, invitation of the Hogg Foundation and uh, got a chance to learn a little bit about what's going on. But let me just begin by saying, um, you have a, uh, a thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for arranging this. Uh, this is an extraordinary opportunity, as Cynthia suggested, for you to get to know more about one another's work and also from a really uh, stellar panel that's been gathered from all over the country to come and share with you about the things that they've been doing over the last 25 years. And I've decided that what I need to do is just to get started and not to be uh, just, just to get in there because you have such a wonderful panel and you have such information and uh, if I get out of your way, you can get to it. So <laughs> That's uh, not true. Uh, I really like to hang out and get to know a little more and say more about how wonderful this group is, but then uh, I will deny them the opportunity and you the opportunity to share what you know. So, um, uh, oh, I can do this, yes. So uh, what I wanna talk about this morning is to try to give you sort of an overview of the evolution of the, f of the work around fathering. And then uh, from my perspective as an economist, but I hope nonetheless to serve like a wide variety of needs to help you connect the work that you're doing with the work that's going on elsewhere in the field and to give you a way to think about it broadly. So um, first of all, uh, if the 1990s was the sort of, uh, sorry, the 1980s was a deca decade of the deadbeat dad and the 1990s the decade of the dead broke dad, the 2020s should be the decade where we recognize that there's a broad swath of men who, uh, who are sort of at the middle or below of the earnings distribution uh, and we pay relatively little attention to them. The group is much larger and more diverse than we tend to think. And if we're going to increase uh, opportunity for children in America to reduce poverty in America, they need to be part of the set of solutions that we, that we derive. And I'm gonna speak really fast uh, because I do really want to, the, the rest of the uh, speakers and all of you to have a chance to exchange with one another. But um, if you, uh, uh, hopefully, Wendy, who's just wonderful, I actually could just take her home and... <laughs> no, no, you can't. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, the long version of these slides hopefully will be part of the, what's distributed in the packet. And uh, you could also go on my website. And uh, uh, much of what I want to talk about, the context for it is in this recent book that I've published called Failing Our Fathers. So um, the fathers that I'm talking about make up to $40,000 a year. So, they're, so not all of them are poor by any means. Uh, and uh, they are, again, much larger, much more diverse, and in ways they are major targets of a lot of things that we're doing in social policy, like uh, uh, the expansion of health care reform and the expansion of the earned income tax credit. So we have them uh, in terms of uh, the targets of social policy in some other areas, and we need to have them more directly focused uh, in our attention in terms of human services, family services, uh, with respect, uh, in this respect as well. So they're kind of two divergent term, uh, trends that have influenced the evolution of this field, one of which was started by this, was provoked or, or uh, motivated by a book that was published in 1999 called Making Fathers Pay. And this popularized the idea of the deadbeat dad. And it helped, it, well, what it, it helped to galvanize support for the nation's effort to close the gaps between children in two-parent families and children in single-parent families by saying there are a lot of men out there who are the father of these children. They've left and they've taken their money with them and as a consequence their families are falling into poverty and we as a society really need to get more focused on making sure that the money comes back. And so if, if you're thinking about or worried about or complaining about why this monetary focus of it, uh, the, federal office of, the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement was begun in 1974, and just four years later, this book comes out and it demonstrates, yeah, there are guys who have books and their kids are poor because they're not contributing and therefore go get the money. And so that's how sort of much of this started. Now, oddly, 1974 is also a critical year in which a 40-year decline in the earnings of less educated men and a stagnation of, of other men below the median also occurred. So what's peculiar is at the, just about the time we got serious about collecting child support, our capacity, the capacity of most men at the middle and bottom of the earning distribution to support their children decline. And so we're doing like this. 
Okay, and so, but we've been, you know, unwavering and increasing in our, in our capacity, our willingness, our technical sophistication about collecting support. But as I will show you in a minute, the, the resources that men have to support their kids, whether they are resident or non-resident, have flatlined or been declining over that same period. And in, in much of the services that we are providing, those two things need to be seared in your head. Okay, so... Uh, so what do we, uh, let's sort of illustrate these trends. So um, the, in 1979, uh, between 1979 and 2012, if you notice those two bottom lines, all that happened to the average hourly earnings of men is that they fell and they, and they, and they rose. So men in 2012, uh, again, the, these are men who earned the average median uh, wage and below the median, all of those men, Essentially, nothing happened to their capacity to support their families from 1979 to 2012. This is not black men. This is not Latino men. These are all men who, who earn below the average wage. And that's a really imp uh, important idea for, for us to understand. Secondly, um, the proportion of children living in two-parent married families has steadily declined since, since 1970. And so in 1970, there must be a light here, yes, no? Yes. In 1970, almost 80% of children lived in two-parent married families, and, the, and those, the proportion of those children has declined to about 50% uh, uh, in, in, in 2010, and it continues to go down. Now, these are two-parent married families. These are not two-parent families, because one of the issues, one of the things that we really know is that cohabitation has now risen, and in, for today, romantic relationship, cohabitation, childbirth, single parenting, that is, the, or that is the norm pattern of family formation in the United States. And so when, when you put together the idea that the capacity of men to support their children has either flatlined or declined, and more and more children are raised, uh, are born into a situation in which their mothers, are mothers and dads are romantically involved, they live together, but then over time, those relationships break up, and that's where single parent families come from. You understand why much of the work that we are doing is what it is, okay? And, and I, and I want to challenge you, most of the work that we're doing in most of fatherhood, not just the child support stuff that, uh, that, that has sort of dominated the work in the field for so long. So, um, but the other interesting thing is that these trends both in uh, family formation on the one hand and men's wages on the other have a distinct race and ethnic pattern. And it's important for us as we look at what we're doing and we look at who we're serving, and we're looking at how we're serving them, I think it's really important to, 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 to be aware of these race and ethnic patterns as well. First of all, black children rarely grow up in two-parent families, and they experience non-resident fatherhood much earlier than other children. And so that's going to have an implication on what, we're, or what, we're, what, what, what all of us are doing. Secondly, Hispanic and, and white children are much more likely than black children to live in two-parent families at birth, but as those children get, get older, uh, particularly among young whites, their relationships break up and their fathers migrate into the non-resident father popu population. And therefore, um, during the years zero to three, um, white and Latino children are much more likely to live with both of their parents, which has an upside. Okay, a big upside, because many of the uh, things that are going on in child development are occurring between zero and three. And so they have that benefit vis-a-vis -vis other children. The Latino children tend to stay together. On the other hand, the white couples who are at the median and below the average wage, they tend to break up, so they'll lose their fathers over time, and, and then many of us will engage. And then finally, Asian children tend to grow up in households that are married. They tend to stay married, but their often wages are very low. And sadly, we blow that off entirely. Because they're married and they're still together, uh, we don't think they need any help. On the other hand, their wages are very low. Uh, that's, uh, that is an, in, an indicator of stress in households. It also means that their children are in programs like Head Start. Those, those stressors cause things like uh, family violence. They, they, they are related to things like child abuse and neglect. And yet, because these parents are married, we don't get to them, and we don't get to their children until something blows up. And so what I want you to begin to understand is this is who you are serving and this is why you are serving them. First of all, their wages are flat. 
Second of all, their family income is flat. And that, that is irrespective of race, ethnicity, uh, but not of education. And as a consequence, their children will migrate into, into certain human service systems. And then we say, well, we want to help the children. Uh, the children come with their mothers, so we're going to help them as well. But we are missing the fact that they also have fathers. And whether or not they're married, the fathers can, are often part of the drama that's going on, but they can be part of the solution as well. OK, so uh, I got that. So um, the other thing I want to talk about just quickly is I just want you to notice how, how important educational attainment has to do with these trends. So the bottom line ba basically says that since, again, 1964, now I'm backing up sort of six decades, the bottom line shows that uh, is the average hourly earnings Sorry, median family income of families headed by high school dropouts. And notice that it is stagnant from 1964 to 1989. And then in 1989, it drops and then sort of goes on after that. Uh, uh, high school graduates, the blue line, are, are sort of flatlining from 1960. This is six decades. You know, so how is it possible that for six decades, the average hourly, uh, the family income, the, in real terms, the ability of these families to buy goods and services, nada has happened to them for six decades. And as a consequence, this is going to have an implication for, first of all, um, for the number of men in these families, uh, the money creates drama, so things break up, and then these fathers who are, who are initially in married parent households migrate into the non-resident population. The other thing that goes on is that, again, couples are not finding themselves earning any more money in terms of their family income, so what happens? Men begin to work harder just to sustain a, a, level, of in, a level of income. Moms begin to earn harder as well, and what does that do? It denies fathers the opportunity to interact with their children because they're working so hard, but it denies moms the same thing. And as a consequence, you will experience family stresses and all sorts of things. And so you'll have needs to serve the non-resident fathers to make sure that child support is paid. But you'll also have needs to serve the resident fathers. And again, much of your work is, is, is emerging out of these families. And again, these are 50, uh, families who are about 50% of all uh, families in the United States. So let me go on. Then uh, the final two things I want to show you in terms of data is uh, data from fragile families. So that, that slide was from national data. These are from the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Survey, which is a birth cohort survey. So we, we interviewed mothers within two hours of the birth of the child, not as if she didn't have something else to do, okay? <laughs> and, then, and then we're following the mom, dad, and child for 15 years. Okay, so we're, we're collecting the 15 and analyzing the 15-year data now, and the, the results that I'm going to show you are from their ninth year. But the, big, the bottom line is, look, the only families that are experiencing increases in income are those who are headed by college graduates or more. All of those other families have no increases in their, essentially in their real incomes from the birth of their children to 2010 when their children are nine years old. That, you, know, you know, I have two kids of my own. Most of us have kids. If your income isn't growing over the first nine years of your kid's life, stuff is, drama is going on. You're struggling. And this is the consequence for, uh, for this birth cohort survey that we've, we, that we've been studying. And then secondly, if you look at this by education and relationship status, the same is true. The only families that are experiencing increases in their earnings after the 2001 recession are families that are headed by whites or families that are married. Everybody else experiences no increase in their earnings over the first nine years when their children are born. So again, Latinos, cohabiting couples, they are two-parent families. Uh, black couples, single, single, single moms, nobody is experiencing any increases in their earnings except the whites who are in these samples, who again, this is a representative sample of children born in 1998. Uh, only married couples and uh, couples headed by married families experience any growth in their income uh, after this dip during the recession uh, for that whole first nine years of their children's life. And we're studying these children and, and asking questions about how do the circumstances of their parents impact child well-being, including whether or not the families stay together. Okay, so bottom line, 
Children living in poverty and lacking opportunity have parents from all race and ethnic groups who are mostly unmarried but often cohabiting at least when their children are born, and they have stagnant earnings. Secondly, their fathers are mostly men with, without college degrees who have difficulty supporting their children and sustaining their families. Some become non-resident fathers who must support their children living elsewhere. African Americans are initially overrepresented among the families who, who, who never lived together at first. That does not mean they are not romantically involved. All right, I can't go there because time won't permit. Um, secondly, whites and Hispanics are initially living together and then they join the non-resident population over time. Uh, um, others, though, remain resident fathers. So they're in two-parent families. A few of them are married. Most of them are cohabiting. And, but they have below average wages and therefore the fathers in these families are working so hard to sustain their families and, and to support their kids that they may not have time to interact with their children in ways that improve child well-being. Let me take the first and hopefully on, the only soliloquy. All right. The thing that makes me understand this more than anything else is my own son and granddaughter. My son is the best dad I know. All right, my, my eldest son, my, uh, my younger son, he's sort of getting some other things done. And he'll be great too. But my, when, I watch, <laughs> when I watch the interaction between my eldest son and, his, and, my, and Ava, his granddaughter, he played Beethoven to her in the womb. Um, he continued to read to her while she, was a, while she was an infant. And when I observed her, when I observed her at 24 months old, speaking in complete sentences. And when I observe her now, she has routine. When they come over for us for Christmas, he's a single dad. So when they come to visit us for Christmas, he's so zonked that all he does is say, Ava, you got it? Mom, dad, you got her? I'm just going to sleep most of the time. And, but but what I, when I'm amazed at, I'm the one who's the type A. Is that surprising? And, um, and so I get up 4 o'clock in the morning. But at 6 o'clock in the morning, Ava is up. Right? She's seven or eight years old. And then she goes and she does her homework. She does, she does her homework that dad has assigned to her. In other words, at eight years old, she'll be eight March, she's developed routine. Nobody has to tell her, Ava, get to it. All right, she's developed. Routine is very important in the lives of kids. But that comes from the interaction that, that Daru has had with Ava. And I sit back with pride and happiness, but also concern and jealousy. Because I understand that that's not happening to most children in America. And as a consequence, the achievement gaps that they're worried about for many kids are not going to happen. And so, so again, I have all this research up to the gazoo, and I published all this stuff. But I also observe in my own household what it means when a parent is ruthlessly devoted to the development of his children and then gets the information about how to pull that off. And essentially, if that's not what you're doing already, that's what you should be doing with respect to both parents. Okay, so moving along. Um, first of all, notice that I've said virtually nothing about the recession of 2007 to 2009. Point being, all of this has been going on for at least 40 years. And all the Great Recession did was make matters worse. Okay, as I, as, I like, as I like to say, the earnings of most men in the United States without a college degree were like somebody who's riding a bicycle, you know, who, who's riding a bicycle up the hill. And all the Great Recession was, was a gust of wind, all right? And the guy's trying to get up the hill, and then the wind blows, and he can't go any further. So these trends are very long-term. And as a consequence, these long-term trends are affecting most men who are of childbearing age today that you are serving, whether they are in single or two-parent families or not. OK? Uh, OK, so that wasn't for me. That was for you. So now I want you to think about, then, how do we think about this, this, these historical facts to think about the way we frame fatherhood programming, which is the subject of your work? And I want you to use this uh, phrase, this acronym, ROWERS. Okay, uh, and what I'm talking about there is readiness, accessibility, 
uh, relationship and support. And I think you will find a, a way to, to, to identify the work you are doing through one of these lenses. Are you doing readiness for kids, uh, for dads, in terms of their readiness to be a father in the first place? Are you worried about access? How much time does this guy actually have to spend with his kid? Either whether he's a non-resident father and the, and the, and the accessibility problem is uh, he has no, no visitation rights, or he's a resident father, but he's working 80 hours a week, and so he can't see his child in the first place. These are things that need to be overcome. Then you could be talking talking about relationships. What is the quality of the relationship between the mother and the father? Because whether they're married or not, the quality of that relationship is going to influence how much and how well the father gets to interact with the child. And then finally, support. This is not only financial support, but de developmental support. Is it that when, suppose fathers get access to kids, do they know what to do, depending upon how old the child is, to, to maximize that child's development? So. Uh, again, readiness, accessibility, relationship, and support. So, um, uh, I don't know all this stuff. Guess what? I just really don't. Uh, there's so much work going on. We, we were talking to dinner last night. There's so much work now going on in the fatherhood field that I, I cannot keep track of it. That's a great thing. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. From, you know, despise not small beginnings. Okay? So, I can't keep track of it of all. But what I've thought, thought about is, well, then you, you have... Under readiness, you have programs, first of all, for teenage fathers. Guys who became fathers when they're 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, part of the issue of that is culture. Okay, And so um, African-American fathers, that is not uncommon at all. All right, among Latino fathers, it is also not uncommon. So what do you try to do? First of all, you try to tell them, okay, you do... You try to reach them before they become sexually active, eight, nine, ten years old. Some of the work in fatherhood is around prevention and making sure that they don't become fathers before they're ready. And we don't talk enough about, about this. And in addition to that, some of them have become fathers. You, we didn't get to them fast enough. And so we said, okay, never mind. Don't go there again. All right? And the reason why we say don't go there again is because we have 40 years of data in the backdrop. We're seeing nothing has happened fundamentally to change those earnings trends in the society. So if you, how in heaven's name are you going to go to college if you have a kid at 17 years old? Do not go there. That's what pregnancy prevention or secondary pregnancy prevention is all about. And then we say, but if you have become a teen dad, I know lots of guys who are teen dads. In fact, some of the big leaders in, in the fatherhood movement are teen dads because they get it. And what they're saying is, if you are a teen dad, what is the best we can do to cement the relationship between the mother and the child so that you have access to the child and get it done? Those are some kinds of things. Then you have availability. A lot of times the availability programming is around visitation and access. And a lot of times this is done within child support enforcement. Child support enforcement over the last 40 years has drawn a firewall between the payment of child support and visitation and access, okay? Just because you have to pay does not mean you have the right to visit your child. And I get that, I understand that. But now we're beginning to understand, guess what? Guys who pay support, hmm, they have contact with their children more frequently. And we don't know which is the cart and which is the horse. So the legal framework of it is still, uh, just because you have, you're paying your child support doesn't mean you get access to your child. However, we're going to do everything we can in the child support enforcement system to figure out how to, how to fuse, how to conjoin the, the financial support of children with access to children. And the champion of that here is Michael Hayes, who's sort of making it happen all around the country, particularly in Texas. I, I can't say how many important innovations have happened in this entire field because of the work done in Texas, which is part of reason why I'm here. But uh, well done, right? Uh, well done, right? Uh, so, however, let me tell you, so what I've done is try to give a typology of different kinds, including home visiting. I just sat next to and met the champion of home, home visiting in, in uh, well, there it is. You know, I'm sort of superfluous, sorry. Uh, um, so, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your first name. No? Uh, Ross? Sa Sasha. So, uh, in, in Sasha's comments, she mentioned this idea having to do with paternal involvement in pregnancy outcomes. And what she said was, they match databases, and what they found is an extraordinary number of children who are abused and neglect don't have their dad's names on the birth certificate. I'm processing that through the work that's going on in pregnancy involvement in paternal outcomes. So what we know is married women are much, likely to ha much less likely to have children who have... Uh, 
uh, low birth weight, and who experiences challenges at birth. All right, and then, so then we figure out, well, what's that about? What is the nature of support that she's getting during the birth of the child that unmarried women are not getting? And then let me go into race. Okay, part of it is that, uh, so, and black women whose fathers are highly unlikely to live with them during the, I, let me do my another, the only two soliloquies. So <laughs> my job as a father a, a, a birthing father was to go and get the oranges. That's, that was it, okay? We talked about what, what we, my job, my wife's from Jamaica, she consumes oranges, like, and all I did, most of the time when my children were pregnant, she gave me that look, and I know the job was, go get the oranges, all right? So what it is, that's what I could do, right? And I, and I did it well. I learned the oranges, you know, the brown ones, and they're very juicy. I did that, and I did that well. So. We're, we're trying to think about what are the variety of things, right? Because um, moms are trying to get their health act together. They're concerned about, you know, what's going on with the birth of the child. There may be complications, all sorts of things. And there are a plethora of ways, right, that men, that the father of the child can support them, including lowering the stress that the mother is experiencing over all of this stuff, which is fresh and new and complicated and risky and all that. But imagine what's going on in the lives of women where that support isn't coming. And then she's trying to negotiate what grandma is saying, and she, grandma, oh, it's like a lot of drama there, and the guy's just, he's gone, right? You know why he's gone? Because he doesn't know what's going on. You know, it's, it's not happening to him physically. The child doesn't become real to him until it comes out of the room. So he's just trying to imagine and experience it. I know they kicked me out of the birthing. It's like, it was what? You know, I was in the birthing room and like I was watching Ron Jr. being born and they said, sorry, so you have to go. I said, well, well I thought we went to the mosque class. I thought this was we. He said, well, look, you look like you're going to fade. So our focus is on her out. And I said, oh, man. But anyway, so, so they knew what they were doing. So I want to speak about the few areas, right, in, in fatherhood that I really know about and then try to relate them to other things that you might be doing. And then so uh, those things have to do with healthy marriage, healthy relationships, co-parenting in this schema and then the employment and training and child support intermediation. And I will try in these comments to relate them to how the field is migrating from that kind of work to other work and then, and then close out. And somebody tell me how I'm doing on time. I'm doing great. I love it. Oh, sorry. So here it is. Ten, oh, whew, 10 minutes. Uh, anyway, what we know is there are about 7.5 million, somewhere between 7.5 um, and 9 million non-resident fathers in the United States. And interestingly, some of them are both non-resident fathers and resident fathers, okay? They're about a third of all non-resident fathers who make up to $40,000 a year. And I think those guys are vulnerable because even after they pay their usual, after they pay their child support, all the child support that is due and their usual expenses, they are poor or near poor if they have one or two children. That is very important. So you guys out there who are doing work in employment and training, you think you're doing something marvelous if you get a guy a $35,000 a year job. I mean, yes, okay? However, um, if he has one or two children and he pays all his child support and pays his rent, his clothing, blah, 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 he is poor or near poor depending upon whether he has one or two children. Now, again, I just wanted us to process that. Um, there are equity considerations here. The mom is taking care of the child. Why shouldn't he, right? There are efficiency issues, issues here. If we're going to collect some, a financial, if we want the guy to be engaged, someone has to put diapers on the child. Okay, but how is that going to get done unless you contribute financially? And how are that, those contributions going to be counted? How do we monitor them unless they're going through the official system? So, you know, it, it, child support makes sense. However, in the ways in which we are arranging child support orders in many states, after they, up to 40 grand, after they make their child support payments in full and pay their rent and make sure they have car fare to go to work, they are poor or near poor. And so uh, I think of all of those guys as economically vulnerable. Um, so what else do we know? Only 40% of, of, um, of all these non-resident uh, uh, non fathers, only 40% paid all the child support they owed of all non-resident fathers, right? Only 40% paid everything they owed, and among this vulnerable group, only a third paid all the support they owed, okay? So one of the reasons why we have so much non-compliance is because of these underlying economic uh, things that we talked about. So then, beginning in sort of the late 1960s and early 1974, uh, we 
created, uh, migrated toward a federal child support enforcement system. And we said, if moms, if children, if we're going to reduce the gaps between the economic resources available to children in single and two-parent families, the guy has got to pay child support. And states took on that responsibility. And then, as with other areas in social policy, said, well, we need the assistance of the federal government to bring its resources to the table uh, because of the interstate commerce things that are related here. And therefore, we established the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement when I was in graduating from college. And since that time, uh, that office has done a great job. However, the ability of men to support their children has declined almost consistently until the Fed and since the federal government got in the game. Also, in the early 1980s, teenage pregnancy was a huge challenge. And so we began to do teenage pregnancy prevention programs targeting girls. And then we discovered, guess what? Well, wait a minute. Who are the fathers? of girls who becomes mothers at teenagers, as teenagers. And the presumption was that most of these are 23, 35-year-old guys who are sexually exploiting teenage girls. Wrong, right? One such relationship is inappropriate. One such relationship is out of bounds. Uh, and I don't understand that. I understand that now that I have a granddaughter uh, before, as better than I did before when I only had sons and brothers. I get that. However, it is not the case. Most, uh, most women have children with fathers who are five years older than them on average. So many of the fathers of teen moms are also teenagers themselves. And so we, we, we put these teenage dads in our gun sites, as it were, and say, well, what are we going to do with them? They haven't even finished school, so they can't pay child support. Let's do secondary pregnancy prevention. All right? And so that's what it was. And then again, uh, divorce framed the way we thought about this. What we, in our minds, what we imagined was this story. They got married, they got divorced, he left and took his money with him. And so the way to fix that problem is, well, we're not putting them back together. That doesn't make any sense. But we are making sure they get the money. And the financial orientation of the, of, the, of, the, of the child support program or of the federal role in that program came, came out of a way in which we were framing what the problem was. By the way, we didn't understand the role of cohabitation. We didn't understand the role of non-marital relationships where couples weren't living together, which is, which is much the case among blacks, because blacks tend to live in large cities where housing costs are very high, and you can't get into public housing dragging the guy with you, right? You got to pretend, I don't know where he is. I don't know. Right? My wife, you know, my wife's dissertation was, now let's get straight. Let, let's, let me say this. Pillow talk created my wife's doctoral dissertation because we were, <laughs> right? We were going to sleep one night, and we're trailing off, and I'm trying to do the best I can. And she said, well, I have to give this uh, training session tomorrow to eligibility workers in the New York City Housing Authority, which is the biggest housing authority in the country. And one of the things in the training manual, she said, is I have to say to these people who are training eligibility workers, uh, uh, if the mom wants to put the dad on the lease, tell her don't do it, because she'll go to the bottom of the list. I said, what? And so I sat up, and we fought about this for an hour and said, well, you've got to write a doctoral dissertation on this. And she did. So, so, so we have lots of things going on in our income security system that prevents couples from coming together and so forth. But divorce framed the way we were thinking about this. People, thank you, people are in relationships. They're married. They're making money. He takes the money and takes the money and runs. And so he has the capacity to pay, get the money back. And so we framed the child support program around that effort. And then what did we do? We had two important discoveries. First, when we got into the game, we discovered that many fathers who were not paying their child support were jobless. They weren't heartless. They just were jobless. And so sanctions up to the gazoo were not going to get the money for these children that they, that they needed. Secondly, so we began to distinguish between guys who didn't want to pay and guys who couldn't pay. And that has framed the way we have done responsible fatherhood programs for the next 20 some odd years. So anyone who tells you that the demonstrations we have been operating around responsible fatherhood have yielded nothing don't understand the deal. OK, in the 1990s, we didn't understand. All we had to do was say, if you don't pay your child support, go to this program. But if I have the capacity to pay, I can't waste my time in some program who's somebody who's never had a job. I'm going to say, never mind. Here's your child support, and I'll go do my under-the-table construction job. That was a very important innovation in the field. And then so we say, well, we got an easy way to figure out who can and who won't. Let's focus on the guys. Who, let's get rid of the guys who won't by saying, if you don't, you got to waste time doing this. And then focus our services on the guys who can't. And we've been doing that for the next several decades. So, let me run through this quickly. Again, 
the race and ethnic patterns in this are very important because when you reach those fathers early, they tend to be black and they tend to be black, right? Because again, black children experience non-resident fatherhood very early. And so if you look around the country, many of the responsible fatherhood programs that are targeted at res non-resident fathers are focused on African Americans. Similarly, uh, if you look at the teenage pregnancy prevention program, because black boys and black girls have children so early in their lives, those also tend to be focused on blacks. And however, the, the other programs that are worried about resident fathers, after 10 years of doing this work, we looked and said, well, wait a minute. In addition to the non-resident fathers and their children who are experiencing challenges, the flatlining of earnings is affecting all men who haven't gone to college. And therefore, there, there are families in our foster care systems, in our child and abuse and neglect systems, in Head Start, in a variety of places who have resident fathers who are not making uh, decent money and their families are experiencing stress, let's reach out to them as well. And so when you're looking, and then when we did that, we said, well, wait a minute. When we reach out to fathers who are resident, guess what? A lot of them are Latino, a lot of them are Asian, many of them are whites. And the cultural norms about how you do family vary by race and ethnicity. So let's park it a minute before we do stuff and understand what are those cultural norms, okay? What does familia mean? Um, how do we think about, um, uh, uh, in some cultures, the patriarchal arrangement of family where the guy determines everything is, we're antithetical to that. But in, but in a Hispanic culture, it may not be. And therefore, there are, it's, for some populations, you want to treat the same sort of issues quite differently so that you can recruit, so that you can retain families, that you can engage them. And so there's all of this conversation in the field about how to, how to serve Asian Americans' fathers, how to serve uh, uh, Native American fathers, Latino fathers. Um, that's not be, um, ethnicity and race are not what's driving that. What is driving that essentially is residents, okay? Asians, Whites and Latinos are more likely to be resident fathers, and then once you acknowledge that and try to deal with the issues they have, well, they say, well, there are also different cultures, so we have to understand the culture, particularize our programming so we can get in there and do work, and then make it happen. And so uh, this is the way lots of the work is going on in the field. So let me get to the bottom line. Um, this is a list of responsible fatherhood programs aimed at non-resident fathers since the early 1980s. Uh, there are two things that you notice like, about this list. Um, first of all, uh, I'm an economist, I can't help it. And one of the things I did, I've never seen this before, I'm sounding like Donald Trump. Um, uh, what I tracked when these programs were occurring in relation to what was happening in the economy, okay? Because these programs are about getting guys who face multiple employment barriers, getting them jobs, and then ensuring that their earnings go to pay child support. But if you look at this, there is only one program, Parents Fair Share, right? This is an early experience, and we kind of didn't have our act together. But um, if you look at this, the Parents Fair Share program is the only large demonstration that has had the benefit of taking place during a period where the unemployment rate is falling before and after the program, OK? One of the reasons why this also was the one program that we know of that was a national program, multi-site, that was rigorously evaluated. And uh, so it was rigorously evaluated. It discovered this strategy, um, you know, distinguished between guys who can't and guys who won't and serve the former. But it also was happening during a period of um, declining unemployment where anybody with a heartbeat could get a job. It's very important. All of the other ones are occurring during periods in which the unemployment rate is rising. And then the most recent programs, the Deficit Reduction Act program, the PAC program, the, the Department of Labor uh, traditional jobs program is occurring during the highest unemployment rate that we experienced during the 1980s. And that ought to modify what we expect about the effectiveness of these programs. Okay, and so are the programs not working because we don't know what we're doing? Or are the programs not working because the climate in which we launch these programs, uh, the economy has something to do with it? Okay, and so we, when, when, we, when we read the evaluations associated with the programs, we want to take into account what's happening in the economy and monitor our, or, or modify our expectations accordingly. So uh, what we have found is essentially Responsible fatherhood demonstrations are, uh, programs are good at doing a couple of things if they're run well. One, they wake up dormant orders, 
okay? They, they, they serve well men who have low labor market experience in the first place. And then what they do is they bring them into child support enforcement offices and they talk to them with the help of a case manager about here is what your child support order looks like. Here is how it got there. When the mother of your child went on food stamps, guess what? You got a child support order, okay? And then they explain to them how they're gonna deal with their order and not to be afraid of the child support enforcement system. And when I met Michael N years ago, I won't say how old he is, okay? Uh, uh, practitioners were afraid to get joined up with the child support enforcement system because they didn't want the bad karma of child support to be passed on to them. But what they ultimately learned is, wait a minute, if we're going to help these fathers who, and their children, we have to provide a bridge for them into the child support enforcement system. And in my view, the ultimate bridge is right there. One of the reasons why the programs have been so successful in Texas is that you take a practitioner who understands what these fathers look like, and then you bring them into the state and help them, help them understand, well, these are some of the things the institution has to deal with. And you take those two kinds of knowledge, give it to a smart guy, bam. You know, Texas is doing ET choices and parenting time and all this stuff, right? But part of it is because you, you've, you've, you've blended, right, at least in the state of Texas, the on-the-ground experience with fathers on the one hand with the institutional experience with child support. So, um, so they wake up dormant orders, but they, um, what they do is they give small gains in employment, small gains in earnings, especially for guys who have, who have the least work experience, and they wake up dormant orders, but they don't de deliver you large amounts of child support. So I've been told I've got no time left. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, no, I get it. So, so um, in the other domains, so the big point I want to make is that we have been doing this, as I showed you, since the early 1980s. And as a result, neglecting for almost that, in, from 1980 to the mid-1990s, all of the resident fathers. Okay, because we've been focused on the non-resident fathers and the consequences for them of, and, their, and their children above flat and declining wages. Meantime, there are these resident fathers who are victims of the same economic climate and whose families are experiencing similar challenges and we've blown them off almost entirely. And then, around about the time pressure emerges, they say, well, what about the resident fathers? Where are their children? Where can we serve them? And how can we help them and their, ch and their families and children manage some of the consequences of the flatlining in earnings? And as a consequence, you get home visiting. You get uh, programs for fathering in abuse and neglect. So, um, so we, we begin looking for opportunities to serve resident fathers in the places where their children show up. We, we begin to worry about pregnancy involvement in, pregn in, in uh, paternal involvement in pregnancy prevention and so on. And so far, here's what we've done. We've said uh, fathers can be important for their children because they maintain good relationships with the mothers of their children. Uh, and so we worked on the relationship aspect first, hoping to improve the quality of marital relationships and cohabiting relationships so that the fathers can have availability and then the idea was that it would improve the quality of parenting and kids would be better. Would you at the last, uh, Wendy, if you could, can you run my movie? Okay, while I'm w closing down. So, and what we've discovered is we don't know how to do it. As yet, we've taken models of relationship education from middle class couples and tried to execute them on lower income couples. Okay, moreover, most of those models are for white couples, and there's nothing wrong with that, white couple in the military or whatever it is, but uh, many of the lower income children that we're serving, their parents are Latino and Asian. And the do family thing among whites is not the same as the do family thing among uh, whites and, and uh, among lower income whites and Asians. And therefore, there's a, there's a big, uh, bridge that we have to uh, cover in trying to figure out how to make these relationship education programs work for the populations that we're serving. And so, in closing, uh, after doing this work for 25 years, it is a stage of development, okay? We don't know how to do the relationship education yet. Uh, the, the early evaluations of the healthy marriage programs and the, and the uh, building strong family programs that were aimed at improving relationship among unmarried couples, they didn't work. 
Okay, and so what we're after is, and what you're after is, okay, what did we learn from those programs? Uh, how can they be done better? How can we be uh, ruthlessly focused on evidence-based practice so that the things we try, we share the lessons and build on them and get better and better at what we do? And that's where we are. In the end, I need my film, I need my film, I need my film, I need my film. I'm not going to get it? Okay, okay. So, I'm, uh, so, so um, but, the, but the big thing I want to indicate, okay? The big thing I want get, to get indicate is, so the research that I'm doing now suggests a couple of things. So I'm working with a developmental psychologist who, who, uh, who was um, you know, a postdoctoral fellow in the 1990s when I met her and now has become the guru of Natasha Cabrera around fathers and child development. And the studies that we're doing, we have to figure out how to nuance this and how to communicate this is, when you increase resident father's money, it has a small impact on child well-being. But that impact is not traveling through any of the things that you would expect. It's not, it, well, it's traveling because families use some of their additional money to make the learning environment better. They buy books and toys and stuff for kids, and, you, and books and toys help children learn. But they don't lower paternal stress. They don't lower maternal stress. They don't, uh, the best we can do is measure how much the father interacts with the child. We don't have the data, because I, we weren't, I wasn't a bit, I wasn't smart enough to put the right data in fragile families 15 years ago. So we don't know anything about the quality of the interaction. And as a consequence, we, we, we can't measure that. So we, we're seeing that increases in the earnings of resident fathers between years one and three have long-term impacts on kids at age nine, but only, as we can measure, only through the materials that they buy. That's very important, but they're really, really small, right? Non-resident fathers, despite the fact that we spend $4 billion a year at the federal level, and then you know, similar amounts of money, maybe $1.8 million at the state level, changes in child support payments by these fathers uh, have no impact, have almost no impact on children at all, okay? And that makes me think, well, what do we, that, my conclusion from that is that money is poorly spent, okay? Uh, again, there are equity reasons. If mom is working and supporting the kids, he's got to do it too, first. Secondly, why am, I going, why am I the taxpayer supporting his kid, right? So there are equity reasons. Um, we're moving all of this through the formal child support system, okay? And we need to, I think, because we've got to count what's going on. Is he meeting the obligation that he has? But in my view, the problem is that we've not merged the payment of child support with the other stuff. Right? with the relationship building, with the access to children, with, with, with building the child-father relationship, and with the parenting skills that make the kid better. So the place that we need to go in that area, while you are doing the work around the availability, relationship, and developmental support, the, the, the money side needs to, we need to merge these two things so that we can do this. Okay? Can you show it? The, the, the last one, the, uh, the reading one. So my colleague Natasha Cabrera in 1999, okay, when I funded her postdoctoral research, was doing, I'm sorry for the quality of this, if you could dim the lights and I'll be off, I promise, just dim the lights. Was, this is an African American father who has probably a high school diploma and what we're looking at is the quality of his interaction with his child, right? He's reading to the child, can you turn, if you, uh, I'll let you see it later, you'll leave it behind. He's reading to his child, he's asking his child what is going on in the story, and he's allowing her to interact with him to report what she sees what she's doing. Um, you know, my wife laughs at me because I never know, I don't know, I'm, I'm, what do I know about child development? Somebody tell me, how old is that child? I, I just don't know. I, 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 right, two to three years old. This is happening well before she's in school. And we know that the achievement occur long before they're ever in school. Okay, so let's tell a story here. Just an imaginary story. Where is the mother? I don't know. Maybe she's resting because she's working all day. Maybe she's at work. Okay, so but the point is, the child has two parents. We know that fathers are capable of interacting with children in very responsive ways. They respond to their cues. And they can be taught to read to them and allow children to react to them in the way they're doing. This is where we need to be going. Okay? We need to make sure that he has a job and that he's paying child support so he has actions. And then we need to work out whatever drama is occurring between him and the mother so that the actions can really occur in terms of the household. And then we need to develop the relationship between the father and the child so that the child feels safe and comfortable in the father's presence. And then we need to figure out how to teach the father what to do when he's interacting with the child. So, 
If you guys, because uh, we are being recorded, I don't think my mic is on, which is ironic, but, um, but we are being recorded. So if you have a question, please stand up and we'll bring the mic to you. And in the, in the meantime, if somebody has a glass of water I could drink. We'll get you a glass of water. Uh, Kenneth? Hey, wonderful. The question I have for you is, what happens when the relationship between that father uh, and the family of their pregnant or their uh, mother keeps them apart. And, and the two want to be together and have a relationship, but the family intercedes and makes sure that that doesn't happen. Um, this is a frequent occurrence um, in the families that we're talking about. And um, part of the issue becomes, and it's, it, it, uh, lots of things are at stake, including <laughs> resources, but one has to think about the extended family that is really around the child. Okay, and one has to, at least for part of this, for the availability part, and I'm glad you asked the question, one has to convey to the grandparents who are mad as, Come on. right, right, you've got my child pregnant and you messed up, blah, 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 blah. You have to convey to them that when that child becomes 16 years old, Try to negotiate whatever space you can between mom and dad so that the child can figure out who am I, where did I come from, and how am I going to go forward and get it done. Okay, we're going to take one more question, even though we're a little bit over. Hello. We have, oh, Russell, okay, and then I'm actually going to let my boss take one. Due to the limitations of like incarcerated fathers, what are some ways that we can enhance fatherhood in, in, in the prisons? you know, through this state as well as through the nation? Yeah, no, I, I think this state is important. I would think, um, I, I, I can take, do this quickly. Oddly, programs in prisons have been one of the most dramatic growth areas in all of this, right? And we have preliminary reports about what's going on in prison and reentry programs that, that I, I, would, I would refer to you for, for that. 
because, again, that's another area. When I was at the Ford Foundation, right, and tried to, do, to get them to do fatherhood work, someone would say, hey, Mincy, you've got to pay attention to the press. Like, Are you kidding? They would throw me out of here. But, 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 but 20 years later, given the boom in incarceration, we have to, so I'm going to be involved, hopefully, in a, in a prison program where the program is going to, as a part of lowering recidivism, it's a two-generation model. And what it's saying is, let's uh, encourage the mothers in a safe space to encourage this visit between the child and the father so that when the father is out of prison, um, his growing relationship with his children, with the mother of his children, whatever they are, uh, can be part of the process that has lowered his lowest decision. And so, but I mean, we have some preliminary results because they've been serious investments in this great program. And, and I, on, on uh, my website, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint has uh, links to, to the OCFE website where they report on what we're learning from the prison programs. Okay, okay. last question before break, Sarah. I feel almost guilty about taking the no, last question. No, no, no. Question. You're okay. Take um, this, thank you so much. This has been so um, informative. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what we know, if anything, about the engagement of the paternal family in the impact on father engagement or father participation. What, what we know about that involvement and, and what it does for that. So, um, what little we know, and this is mainly from qualitative studies, is that often um, the mother maintains a relationship with the with the paternal grandmother. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. some and and to the extent that the father is engaged at all, it's because the relationship between mom and maternal, um, the relationship between the mother of the child and the paternal grandmother is functional. Mm -hmm. Okay, and therefore. The, the paternal grandmother can be an asset in sort of keeping the father engaged. And I saw this in Baltimore in the 1990s as part of the programs they were doing. So let me just end on this. So um, I have only brothers and sons, okay? And um, so the gifts that I've had of late are my granddaughter and my daughters-in-law, okay? And um, my daughter-in-law's mom passed away uh, within the past few months. and. Um, my wife always beats me up because I call my daughter-in-law my daughter, right? Because I took the heart, you know, when you marry, you, you, get a, you don't lose a son, you get a daughter. But I never had a daughter before, right? So this was like, wow, this could be deep. Let me, let me go in there and see, <laughs> see what's in there, right? So, but, but, but what I've learned is, what I learned through the process is daughters and their own mothers have drama, right? That's associated with female, female, right? Uh, and that drama is well-developed, okay? <laughs> However... <laughs> What can happen between a daughter and her paternal, the relationship between my daughter-in-law and my wife is, is coming along. Because my, my, my wife is a mature woman. She's been married forever, right? I've been married since I was 23 years old. Uh, Becky hangs around and just laughs at the stuff that we do because it mirrors the stuff that Ron Jr. does, okay? And so in a way, the paternal mother can be an asset, right? Because she's an older woman, she knows stuff, but all that drama associated with growing is not there. It's a, it's a clean slate. And again, if we can get them to be co-conspirators in the process, that's, I think, where we go in that area, okay? Uh, again, you're going to learn so much from these guys and so much from one another, and I wish I could hang around. Thank you for your attention. Get my book, do your work, get it done, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.